Listen only mode. Hello, welcome to Prairie Conservation Action Plan's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Morose and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan or PCAP. Every month, PCAP asks someone to present either in the form of a webinar or an in-person talk in a Saskatchewan community on anything to do with native prairie conservation or species at risk. Stay tuned for our upcoming Native Prairie Speaker Series webinars. On April 26, Brenda Dale, retired from Canadian Wildlife Service, will be doing an online webinar presentation about citizen science. On May 3rd, Danielle Levesque with the Native Plant Society of Saskatchewan will be doing a webinar about the Master Naturalist Program. I would like to take a moment to note that in-kind support for today's webinar has been given by the University of Montana. This project was undertaken with the financial support of the Government of Canada and the Federal Department of Environment and Climate Change Canada. Now a bit about our presenter. Joe Smith received his Bachelor of Science in Wildlife Biology from the University of Montana in 2007 and his Master's of Science in Fish and Wildlife Management from Montana State University in 2011. Joe completed his PhD in Fish and Wildlife Biology from the University of Montana in December 2016. Despite the names of two out of his three degrees, he claims to know next to nothing about the biology of fish or how to manage them. Joe is currently residing in Missoula, Montana, where he is working on a postdoc investigating various ecological questions related to conservation of sage grouse and other sagebrush associated species on private lands in support of the Natural Resource Conservation Services Sage Grouse Initiative. If anyone has any questions during the presentation, please type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. And now I will turn it over to Joe. Can you hear us, Joe? Yep, I can hear you. Perfect, and you're welcome to go ahead. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. All right, great. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction, Caitlin. Um, so I'm going to be talking about, um, basically going to be covering uh, the, the topics uh, that I uh, addressed in my dissertation research. Um, I just finished up my PhD uh, back in December, like Caitlin said. Um, so yeah, this is called a multi-scale evaluation of voluntary efforts to reduce fragmentation and enhance rangelands for sage grouse, which is uh, a mouthful. Uh, I apologize for that. <laughs> um, so I, I cut out a bunch of slides from, from my introduction because um, I'm talking to a group of people that's already kind of intimately familiar with a lot of the issues of, of doing conservation in uh, temperate grassland and shrubland systems. Um, but I left this slide in here just to kind of uh, to remind me to mention that you know, those of us who, who work in these systems are, are really the, the heroes of conservation um, because this is these temperate grasslands and, and savannas and shrublands globally are, are um, are really in a conservation crisis. Um, we've on the on the left hand side of this figure here. Uh, you're looking at the proportion of these uh, this biome globally that's been converted to uh, human uses, and then on the right side, uh, the proportion of the of the uh, biome that's that's been protected. So these uh, temperate temperate systems, temperate grassland and shrubland systems, are are really some of the most converted and, and least protected uh, habitats worldwide. Um, we've completely lost, uh, you know, about about half of them, and, and we've pr really done very little to protect what remains. So, um, moving a little bit 
closer to home, uh, the, the North American Great Plains are one of the world's four temperate grassland systems. Um, and many of these charismatic species that we think of when we think of the, the Great Plains, uh, like bison and, and black-footed ferrets and, and swift foxes, um, are, are relegated to really just tiny isolated fragments of, of their former ranges. And they require a lot of active management where they, where they still remain because most of their habitat um, globally is, is gone. And uh, what happened to their habitat was, was cropland conversion. Um, this is, uh, there's a reason they call the Great Plains the breadbasket of the world. This is one of the most productive uh, grain growing regions uh, globally. Um, more than 50% of the native grasslands in the Great Plains uh, are already gone, um, converted to cropland. And when you're breaking that down to specific types of, of grasslands, others, you know, there's uh, like the, the tall grass prairie uh, has, has experienced a lot more conversion than that. There's a lot less of it left. But um, this is a figure, uh, sorry, it, sorry it ends at the, at the U.S. border, but uh, this is a figure from a, a pretty recent paper um, where they tried to uh, quantify the amount of ongoing cropland conversion. So they looked at the period from uh, 2008 to 2012, so five-year period, um, and looked at uh, the acres uh, of previously uncultivated land uh, that were brought into cropland uh, during that period. And you can see that the Northern Great Plains is really a hot spot uh, for ongoing, ongoing cropland conversion. So it's um, this is more than more than seven million acres uh, were converted there during that five-year period, and that's a that's a rate of habitat loss that's actually greater than uh, the loss of Amazon rainforests. Um, and the pressure is re is really increasing, uh, like I said, in the in the northern Great Plains, kind of on the western edge, areas that have traditionally been too high and too dry and too difficult to farm. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, jump right into my, my critter that I focus on, uh, the greater sage grouse. Um, this is really a, a perfect example of a, of a conservation reliant species that um, is a sort of an indicator of this ecosystem that's, that's in a lot of trouble. They've been called a, a landscape species and um, that has to do with the fact that they require uh, big intact sagebrush dominated landscapes um, for all their different uh, life uh, life stages. Um, these these guys have pretty big home ranges. You know they're they're, a, they're about a five pound bird, but or two two and a half kilogram bird. <laughs> uh, try to put this in, in uh, metric for you. Uh, so you might expect them to have a home range kind of similar to. Um, to a pheasant or something like that, but these guys actually have home ranges that are more more on the order of of an elk elk home range. So these guys uh, cover cover pretty big areas. Um, so almost uh, fifty percent of their range has been uh, lost or uh, it has been contracted due to due to uh, loss of their habitat, um, and they were. Uh, petitioned eight times uh, between 1998 and 2010 for listing under the U.S. Endangered Species Act. Um, in 2015, there was a decision that they were not warranted for protection because um, ongoing uh, state and federal and, and voluntary efforts were deemed sufficient, that they didn't need to be put on the list. Uh, but that decision is going to be revisited again in 2020. and. Um, Again, this is because this is a Canadian group. I, I guess I should I should touch on the fact that you know we we had this this big five year debate about whether they should be listed here in the U.S. where we have about probably half a million birds left, and I, I think in all of Canada there's probably less than 500 left right now. So um, I don't need to I don't need to probably convince you guys that there there's uh, uh, an issue that needs to be addressed with their conservation. So. Sage grouse still exist across a pretty big area, um, 11 states in the U.S. and uh, two Canadian provinces. So they cover about 165 million acres, which is shown in the light gray shading. 
Um, and then the dark gray areas indicate places where they're, uh, they have particularly high abundance. And uh, this, their range has been divided into these sort of discrete management zones because where you are in the range, um, uh, the habitat can look very different and, and the types of threats that you work on also vary depending on, on where you are. So moving kind of from west to east here, um, in, the, in the western half of their range, they, they deal with um, issues like uh, these uh, exotic annual, annual grasses that have been invading uh, lower elevation sagebrush dominated habitats. And uh, they have this interaction with fire that's just uh, eaten up millions and millions of acres of former sage grass, uh, uh, sagebrush uh, bunch grass. And then at, in higher elevations, you have uh, native but uh, encroaching um, conifers that, that have kind of been on this slow but steady downhill march, um, also gobbling up quite a bit of, quite a bit of former um, sagebrush rangelands. So uh, moving, moving a little farther to the east um, on the, in the Rocky Mountain region, both in the Great Plains Management Zone and Wyoming Basins, and down into Colorado, we've seen a, a big increase in um, fossil fuel development, oil and gas drilling. Um, it's really exploded over the last uh, couple decades. And um, they're very sensitive, sage grass are very sensitive to the impacts of, of that type of development and the infrastructure that goes along with it. And then everywhere, there's pretty much everywhere in their range, there's, there's issues with uh, infrastructure development, uh, power lines, roads, that type of thing, ex-urban development. Um, and then uh, what I'll be focusing on today um, in the northern Great Plains, um, the, the major threat to uh, sage grouse in this management zone is, is cropland. Um, and Cropland's uh, the kind of thing where once you know once it's been converted, it's it's pretty much gone. It's very difficult to recover from uh, from that. And uh, basically, anywhere where there isn't cropland um, in in this region, um, there's there's livestock grazing going on. So these are kind of the two uh, dominant land uses. Um, agriculture is really the the economic engine of this whole this whole region. Um, and livestock production here primarily means uh, grazing of, of native rangelands, and a lot of it is it's um, virgin, you know, never been never been plowed up uh, uh, sagebrush kind of sagebrush uh, grassland mix. So these are these are the two land uses that I'll be talking about most today. Um, I'm also going to be mentioning um, SGI or the Sage Grouse Initiative quite a bit uh, throughout today's talk, so I'll, I'll take a minute and explain what that is. Uh, in 2010, when the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, came to their warranted but precluded decision, uh, the, the USDA, the so U.S. Department of Agriculture, um, has uh, the Natural Resources Conservation Service under it, uh, which is a... Um, the conservation branch of U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, they launched this sage grouse initi initiative to try to uh, get uh, get some conservation work done on the ground that would, that would preclude the need uh, for a listing uh, when that came up in 2015. So uh, NRCS is a, is a non-regulatory agency. Uh, they work mostly with private landowners uh, to do voluntary and incentive-based conservation. And SGI kind of re represents a, a big step forward in the evolution of how NRCS uh, does uh, conservation work uh, in that it's, it's science-driven, and science really um, comes into SGI in, in kind of two different ways. One is... Um, is guiding investments, so so using using science to target where they're going to get the most bang out of their buck uh, when it comes to investing uh, dollars for conservation, and then the other is to evaluate outcomes of of the practices that they use. So the the uh, leadership of SGI is, is fairly heavily invested in in science, 
And in the Great Plains, uh, the, the practices that they're, they're using, at least the primary practices they've been using um, for, for the Sage Grouse Initiative are, one, um, conservation easements uh, to try to reduce cropland conversion um, in areas that, uh, where cropland would have a negative impact on sage grouse. And then uh, the second one is uh, what they call prescribed grazing. Most of the rest of the world calls rotational grazing. Uh, rotational grazing systems um, to try to improve habitat quality um, of, of these range lands that are grazed by livestock. Okay, so uh, the, the, the gaps in knowledge and what I'm trying to, uh, what I tried to address with my uh, dissertation work um, on, the, on the cropland conversion side uh, and the, tar the easement targeting side, we know that Cropland conversion is, is the, the biggest threat to, to habitat conservation in, in this region, in this Great Plains Management Zone, but a lot of things were unknown about, about this impact. So things like the scale um, at which it operates, um, how severe it is, and um, the extent of potential future impacts um, were totally unknown. And Ultimately, managers needed some sort of targeting tool that would uh, tell them uh, or allow them to, to prioritize uh, potential potential places for conservation easements. On the grazing side of things, uh, we've we've known uh, for quite a while that that livestock grazing is probably the most compatible land use for sage grouse, but there's still been um, uh, a the, a pervasive thought that improper improper grazing uh, is a threat to, to grouse, but really nobody knows what proper grazing um, looks like uh, specifically. So, and there's just there's just really little uh, uh, empirical evidence or, or science um, linking grazing and sage grouse. So we just don't know a whole lot about how uh, the mechanisms through which grazing affects sage grouse populations. <clears throat> so, uh, the three big uh, sections of today's talk are going to be organized like this, um, kind of uh, covering covering this, the spectrum from these big top-down kind of thirty thousand foot view of ecology drivers of drivers have habitat loss, um, looking at how how cropland affects the distribution of populations, um, and then what can be done about uh, to prevent future habitat loss from cropland conversion. And then moving moving down in scale onto the ground, um, we're we're trying to figure out uh, more about these mechanisms through which livestock grazing affects uh, nest site selection and nest survival uh, for sage grouse. And then um, trying to find out whether uh, these rotational grazing systems that SGI is implementing across across the range in the U.S. Um, trying to figure out whether those are actually increasing um, habitat quality for, for nesting grouse. And then uh, this, this, third, this third section, which is the third chapter in, in my dissertation, um, we, we found some interesting things uh, about uh, the effect of, of grass height, uh, uh, which is, has been thought to be an important metric um, of, of sage grouse habitat quality, um, providing providing cover for nesting grouse. Uh, we're so we're we're looking at in, into some detail on that um, about whether that's uh, a meaningful indicator of habitat quality and, and a meaningful um, management target. <laughs> so for uh, this first section, our our objectives, uh, getting a little more specific, were. Uh, first, to model population distribution as a function of cropland to identify the scale and severity of that threat. And then use uh, some simulations to build out um, cropland uh, in, in that region and look at what the potential future impacts would be to the population. Um, and finally, uh, develop a prioritization tool that we can give to managers to help them uh, Target efficiently target land for for putting conservation easements down, and this all of this um, work was was published last year in uh, Biological Conservation, 
Um, so if you want more details on any of it, um, look for it there. So just some necessary background to understand what we were doing here. Um, sage grouse are a, are a communally breeding uh, species that use what's called a lek um, uh, as a, a location where the, the males get together in the spring and display, and then the females come to select a male uh, to mate with. So these leks represent kind of an important focal area uh, during the breeding season. Um, from, from the lek, the females then kind of radiate out into the surrounding, um, surrounding landscape to nest and then uh, rear their broods. So these are, these are pretty important uh, uh, focal, focal areas kind of describing the geographic um, uh, distribution of populations. And lek activity and attendance have, have both been shown to be very sensitive to disturbance at, at pretty large spatial scales. So uh, we were using um, inhomogeneous Poisson point process models, uh, which for all intents and purposes, we're just comparing kind of uh, uh, areas that are actually used by birds for lecking to, uh, to the available area in, in the landscape. And scale was a major focus of, of, our, of our question because um, the, you know, this targeting tool is going to be used to uh, to purchase easements, which are which are fairly expensive, um, so you, if you don't if you don't conserve enough habitat around lex, if you get the scale too small, um, you know you may you may just not not be conserving a, a large enough area to to have a meaningful impact. But if you get the scale too big, um, you might end up wasting uh, precious precious resources. Uh, unnecessarily. So we were using, we were looking at a range of scales from uh, just under a kilometer to uh, 10 kilometers um, to try to figure out what what the most supported scale uh, was. So our, our next steps where we where we were simulating um, future cropland conversion uh, involved uh, we, we needed to know uh, areas areas that were more and less suitable uh, for cropland. So uh, it's obviously not everywhere is, is equally suitable and equally likely to be converted. So um, a couple of, of collaborators with uh, the Nature Conservancy, um, who are co-authors on this paper, uh, helped us develop a cropland suitability model that's based on several dozen uh, variables describing the soil and climate and uh, topography <coughs> um, uh, and, and connecting, linking those to, to likelihood of, of being, um, of supporting cropland. So what you're looking at here is, uh, this is the, the United States portion anyway of, of the Great Plains sage grouse management zone. Uh, the, the black dots are uh, are currently active lex, or they were active during this period of 2008 to 2012. Um, and then the the blue to red shading indicates uh, from from low to high uh, crop suitability. So we had this um, this layer, this continuous layer at a 30 meter resolution for uh, covering our entire study area. So. Um, to develop a, a prioritization scheme to, to rank various parcels in terms of, of their priority for, for conservation easements, we looked at a few different, uh, different scenarios. One, one would be if we did nothing at all, we didn't purchase any additional easements, um, what we wanted to know, you know what, what might happen to the population. So this, this figure is just showing as you move from, from left to right on the, on the x-axis, you're, you're adding more and more, expanding cropland farther and farther. And then on the y-axis, this is uh, indicating the percentage of the remaining sage grouse population that we would expect to lose. So these are kind of our hypotheses. If we didn't do anything, if we didn't put any more easements down, um, we'd expect some, you know, uh, increasing percentage of the population to be lost as we increase cropland expansion. Um, a common, a common targeting method when when you don't have uh, a whole lot of information um, is just to use uh, the 
the abundance of the of the critter you're trying to conserve. So we might we might just uh, look at each parcel in terms of how many birds, how many how many males were counted on the lex um, in the area surrounding that parcel, um, and just use use that that abundance as, as our uh, ranking criteria. So if we did that, we might expect we would uh, we would lower the slope of that line. Um, we'd, we'd lose less of the population for a given amount of cropland expansion. But the problem with this targeting method is that if, um, if abundance and, uh, and of birds and, and risk of cropland conversion are uh, correlated, uh, are, 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 sorry, are, are negatively correlated uh, rather than positively correlated, then we could be, we could be making some pretty inefficient choices doing this. So we looked at a third scenario where uh, priority was, was proportional to um, abundance multiplied by risk of conversion, um, and then we also put cost of acquisition in there. So this is kind of our most sophisticated, um, and it's not even that sophisticated, but it was our, it was our more sophisticated um, uh, prioritization scheme. So in this case, um, high abundance in areas of high risk of conversion um, and for equal abundance and risk, you go for the lowest cost. Um, that's kind of the, the, the ranking criteria. So to jump right into some results, uh, the uh, looking at the different scales, we found that this uh, 3.2 kilometer um, or, or two mile scale surrounding the lek was kind of the most relevant scale um, at which cropland seemed to be influencing um, the location of leks. So not not huge, but not tiny either. Um, and at that scale, uh, the response was pretty pretty severe. So. Um, what you're looking at here is uh, as you increase proportion cropland within that 3.2 kilometer buffer, um, this is the expected um, intensity or, or density of, of, of lex that you'd expect to see. So basically, translate this as you know, as you increase increase cropland at that scale, um, you're you're rapidly uh, 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 your expectation of, of seeing a lack is, is rapidly declining. Um, and what we, what we see in, in terms of just looking at active, active lacks on the landscape currently is that about 96% of, of active lacks have less than 15% of that area um, in cropland. So they, they seem to be very uh, sensitive to, to cropland um, at kind of this intermediate spatial scale. So from uh, looking at, at the uh, stochastic uh, build-out scenarios, uh, we'd expect only to lose about uh, six or seven, well, five, five to seven percent of, of the current population, um, even under a fairly severe cropland uh, build-out scenario. So, so really this means that um, you know, even, if, even if we do, do nothing, um, because abundance and 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 risk of conversion are actually fairly negatively correlated in this landscape, um, we we don't expect uh, the future the the uh, future outcomes for sage grouse to be uh, that that severe. Um, basically, grouse prefer to be in areas that really aren't that suitable for cropland in the first place, which is a good thing. Um, now, if we if we use this simple abundance targeting where we're just going to areas with the most birds um, and putting putting easements in those areas. Um, we, we What we found is kind of surprising that we, we really wouldn't expect to get any gains at all. And what we what we did here is we um, we simulated, I should, I should have mentioned this before, we we simulated a hundred million dollar investment in, in conservation easements. So you can spend, what this is telling you is that you can spend $100 million in conservation easements and um, go after the areas with the most birds and really have no effect whatsoever on, um, on the outcome. Uh, but if we, if we use 
uh, this benefit loss cost targeting. So that's that's looking at abundance and risk and cost together. Um, we can have uh, pretty substantial impact um, overall, reducing potential losses by about 80% with that same $100 million investment. So takeaway message just is that um, because of this negative correlation between abundance and risk, um, accounting for risk is really is really critical. Um, and you end up you end up targeting um, areas really that have kind of moderate abundance and moderate risk. That's that's the sweet spot that's most efficient. So um, what we tried to do here is kind of lay the groundwork for for um, uh, these organizations that that acquire easements uh, to start start. Um, acquiring easements in a, in a fairly efficient way to, to prevent future cropland conversion. Um, and and we're able to kind of guide them at, at several different scales. So at the looking at that whole study area, this U.S. portion of management zone one, um, we were able to uh, identify the five uh, kind of high abundance areas that have uh, the, the most uh, males at risk of, of future uh, future impacts and then within within those areas we can identify the specific leks that are most vulnerable to cropland conversion and then zooming in a little bit farther um, you know surrounding those particularly vulnerable leks we can actually identify um, which individual parcels of private land um, are are most most likely to be converted. Which ones are the are the ones that are going to be most um, uh, attractive to you know people who who want to uh, grow more crops? So um, these are the kind of targeting tools that we've provided. Um, you know, most of the most of the uh, NGOs and and uh, government organizations here in in Montana, um, so they can start uh, start using these to to um, prioritize uh, potential easements. And uh, the kind of rewarding part of having done this done this work and, and, and getting that information out there is that uh, you know we've we've already seen we've already seen this um, science uh, you know put into the implementation phase. So um, last or two years ago the state of Montana set aside a ten million dollar fund uh, that was uh, mostly uh, intended to, to be used for conservation easements um, on private land. And they've gone through uh, one phase of, of accepting applications and, um, and granting those easements. And um, you know, we've seen uh, some, of the, some of the areas that lit up uh, in, our, in our model of, of as places of highest priority um, have already been uh, had easements pretty much closed. I think they're in the they're in the last phases of kind of finalizing those easements. So, some folks that I know um, out in eastern Montana in our in our field study area have actually um, got easements on their on their ground now because of this. So, um, that uh, moves us into the into the. Kind of second major major focus of my of my dissertation, or the second chapter of my dissertation, where I'm looking at um, at grazing. So now we're now we're kind of getting down into the uh, issues of, of of habitat management in these places where where we still have grouse. You know, um, how 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 do we manage those areas to to try to get you know get the most birds per acre and, and um, so, as I mentioned before, SGI one of their one of their biggest investments um, was these uh, grazing systems. And one of the first places that they started putting grazing systems on the ground was in central Montana. Um, so this this map here, uh, the in the inset map, that little red box is where we're looking at. Uh, this is about 50 miles north of the town of Billings, Montana. Um, and back in 2010, or right around 2010, um, the NRCS, the local NRCS office in, in the town of Roundup started um, 
started uh, looking for uh, ranchers who uh, were interested in implementing these uh, rotational grazing systems um, to try to specifically, they're specifically designed to try to um, increase habitat quality for sage grouse. So they were able to enroll uh, 10 ranches uh, totaling about 125,000 acres. Um, and these, uh, all, all of these grazing systems, the implementation started sometime between 2010 and 2012. Uh, I just want to mention here, uh, this, this field project uh, that I'll be describing is a, a collaboration between uh, University of Montana and uh, uh, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Um, so I want to thank uh, Laurel Berkeley and, and Mark Sapinski with Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks because they kind of ran the day-to-day the -day of this project and, and none of this would be possible uh, without them. So. Um, we, we focused, uh, or at least I, I focused on, on nesting, um, and the reason for that is because uh, nesting has been shown to be uh, a, a driver of population growth in sage grouse. Um, so some life, sense, life stage sensitivity analyses that were done, published back in 2012, um, just showed that uh, there was a pretty high correlation between um, nest success and, and population growth in sage grouse. So we focused on, on nesting for this reason and also because uh, there are so many um, hypotheses out there about um, how this was kind of one of the major impacts of, of grazing. So there are two um, pervasive hypotheses about how livestock affects sage grouse nesting. One would be a, a direct effect where uh, you see uh, live, uh, livestock either trampling or just getting too close to a nest and causing the female to abandon. Um, and then the other one would be indirect where um, sage or uh, sorry, livestock grazing around, uh, around a nest are actually reducing um, sort of the hiding, the hiding cover. They're, they're eating herbaceous vegetation, reducing that kind of screening cover around the nest that hides, helps hide the, the female in the nest from potential nest predators. So reduced hiding cover would lead to increased predation rates. Uh, in terms of what we expected to see with these rotational grazing systems, um, and, and I, I, should, I should back up just a second. Um, the, so the dark shaded areas on this map are, are ranches, these 10 ranches that are participating in SGI rotational grazing systems. Everything else, pretty much everything else on this map is, is either uh, private, privately owned or, uh, or uh, Bureau of Land Management, uh, federal, federally owned, but it's all, it's all grazed, but uh, just they're using a, a variety of different grazing systems. Most of them are, are much less intensively managed than SGI rotational grazing. A lot of it is just season-long grazing or, or they're doing slower rotations through a smaller number of pastures and they're always kind of using the same, um, the same rotation each year. So our comparison is, is SGI rotational grazing systems to everything else because we want to know um, just if, if SGI rotational grazing systems are, are giving us any lift, you know, are any, are any better kind of than the average um, grazing strategies that people use in this region. And what we expected to find was um, that we'd see an increase in uh, live grass height and, and residual grass height. So residual being kind of a leftover from, from last year. Um, we'd see an increase in, in herbaceous vegetation cover um, and also an increase in, in visual obstruction, so just kind of the, the height density of, of herbaceous uh, vegetation. And we assumed that these effects on vegetation would then translate into to higher nest survival. And uh, nine out of the ten landowners that were enrolled in SGI rotational grazing systems elected um, to incorporate rest into their uh, grazing system. So um, on these branches, they identified um, pastures that had uh, suitable nesting habitat, and then 20% of that area 
uh, was rested each year, so didn't see any grazing um, on a rotating basis. And they, and they rested it so that um, they would get two full nesting seasons without livestock grazing. So um, rest, uh, at least in these systems, generally lasted about 15 months or a little more than that. And what we expected to see there was just um, just additional increases in, in, in herbaceous hiding cover and, and maybe an, an additional um, boost to nest survival. So to, to analyze these data, we, we, um, well, we, we collared a, a whole bunch of sage grouse and we found a whole bunch of nests. And then um, we, we looked at both nest site uh, factors related to nest site selection and nest survival. So where they put their nests and uh, how, how, how the nests do um, in terms of survival. Um, and we looked at factors um, at several different spatial scales. So uh, we looked at uh, factors measured at, at kind of a, a grain size of, of a kilometer. Um, and we uh, had a what we called a patch scale grain size. It was 100 meters. And then we had um, data within our field plots, which was a, about a 15 meter scale surrounding the nest and all the way down to uh, you know, measurements of the nest shrub itself. And we used uh, uh, Bayesian methods to, to um, with some indicator variables to, to take care of uh, variable selection and inference. Um, I'd be happy to answer questions on that later, but I won't get uh, too too into the nitty gritty details of that here. Um, and then we we analyzed uh, differences in vegetation structure between. SGI grazing systems and, and everywhere else uh, using uh, linear mixed models. So what we found was was a bit of a surprise. It was, it was not, not exactly what we were expecting. So what you're looking at here are factors uh, in the model um, that we looked at uh, for nest. This is nest site selection. So uh, you know what what variables are related to uh, preference or uh, preferred or avoided for for nesting the things we thought would be that, that hens would be keying into um, that were that could be related to grazing things like herbaceous vegetation cover residual cover um, livestock use we didn't find that any of these things were actually uh, supported um, so the the black dots uh, indicate mo or variables that were supported statistically supported the open dots indicate variables that were not statistically supported. And then if it's on the right-hand side of that vertical zero line, um, it's, uh, it's indicating preference. And then if it's on the left-hand side, it's indicating avoidance. So um, the ones that are highlighted here, um, none of those were supported. And those were kind of our grazing-related uh, variables. The things they were keying in on were things like uh, uh, they were preferring to be farther from roads. Um, they were preferring areas with uh, just less less disturbance at that one kilometer scale, less, less anthropogenic disturbance, um, lower, uh, uh, more, more even uh, stands of sagebrush um, in areas of gentle topography uh, and high sagebrush cover at the plot scale and then larger nest, nest shrub size. These are all kind of variables that have, have come out as important um, in past studies of, of sage grouse nesting. So no, no real surprises here except that all of our herbaceous um, vegetation metrics were not supported. So this is the same type of figure but this is now showing you um, variables in uh, in the nest survival model so uh, what was what was related to um, nest survival again um, these highlighted uh, these yellow highlighted variables things like livestock use uh, around the nest um, herbaceous cover and then the height of, of residual live grass and um, and that height density metric visual obstruction None of those things came out as, as supported, uh, contrary to our expectations. What did 
uh, come out as, as highly significant was um, this measure of rainfall. Um, and this was something that we, we took account of because of one year that we had that was just, you know, we had a, we had a whole lot of rain and we saw a whole lot of nest mortality. So we, we knew we kind of had to account for it. But that came out as, as the most significant predictor of, of nest survival. So these, a lot of rain over, over a period of several days um, really, really had negative effects on, on nest survival. And then uh, nests that were farther away from um, major roads, so these are, are uh, county or, or, or highway, county roads or highways, things that have uh, sort of a crown and ditch construction. A lot of them have probably power lines along them. Um, the far, farther away, nests farther away from, from those types of roads tended to do a little bit better. So uh, this slide is just showing you comparisons um, of SGI rotational grazing systems to everything else, and also looking at um, at those rested pastures. So um, given that I just told you that none of none of those herbaceous uh, vegetation structure metrics were related either to preference or or success of nests, it's probably not a big surprise that we saw no difference in nest survival among our three treatments. So um, no difference depending on you know whether you were in um, uh, not enrolled in, in SGI rotational grazing systems, enrolled in SGI rotational grazing systems, or um, uh, in areas that were that were rested. Um, on the right hand side here, uh, this is just looking at this is just a comparison of, of all of these uh, herbaceous uh, vegetation structure metrics um, between uh, the, the, the light gray uh, dots are um, the everything else, those are non-enrolled lands, and then uh, the dark dots are, the, the black dots are, are ranches enrolled in SGI rotational grazing systems. And, um, you know, the, what, what probably sticks out immediately is this, that these, these lines are right on top of one another. Um, there's no real clear differences between, between the two. And, and, that's, and that's, that was pretty much supported um, statistically too. We did see a, a, a slight, um, a statistically significant but very slight increase in live grass height uh, as a uh, response to SGI rotational grazing systems. And then um, pasture rest, so those, those pastures that didn't see any grazing for at least 15 months, uh, those tended to have slightly higher visual obstruction and slightly less litter, about 3% less litter, which makes sense just because you don't have uh, big hoofed animals pounding all the dead material down onto the ground. So a f just a couple of statistically significant differences that we had absolutely enormous sample sizes. So um, these are, you know, very, I would say very modest or almost negligible um, differences between in vegetation structure between rotational grazing systems and what everybody else is doing. Um, <clears throat> so this, this study took, took place over, over five years and, and we were, we were fairly lucky that we, we got, we got to see a, a, uh, some some pretty big variation, uh, some a lot of variation in in uh, weather during that five year period. So we started the study in 2011, and uh, 2011, uh, the winter of 2010 2011 was severe, and then we had uh, we had some pretty severe storms that during that spring. And um, we actually, in the, for yeah, Montana Climate Division 5, uh, if you look at March through August uh, precipitation, which is kind of the, what I'm calling the breeding season, the sage grouse breeding season, um, kind of from, from lecking all the way through to brood, end of brood rearing period, that was the, uh, we saw the highest amount of precipitation during that period on record for that climate division um, since records began in, in 1948. 
And then the following year, 2012, we saw the lowest amount of precipitation on record during that period. So um, again, pretty, pretty dramatic variation um, in weather. So we, we got to really see the full spectrum. Um, and that, that translated into um, kind of explaining the, the variation in nest survival that we saw over, over the period or over the study period. So the top panel here, you're seeing a, a wet spring. This is 2011, where we had all the, all the flooding and all the um, just nasty conditions. Um, so the, the blue bars are just showing you daily precip uh, across the entire uh, nesting season. And then uh, the, the red dots show um, estimated daily nest survival. Uh, and then the, the lines are, are credible intervals. So you can just see that when you have long periods of, of, of rainfall, nest survival is really taking a big hit. And then the bottom panel just shows you the, the, the driest or the one of the drier springs, not the driest, but um, the, the year where we had our highest annual um, nest survival, that was uh, 2014. And we, we had a fair amount of days with precipitation, but none of these long extended periods of, of really heavy rain and um, nest survival ended up pretty being pretty high overall. Um, I think it was over 60 percent. So just some takeaway points here. Um, we confirmed what other studies have shown that anthropogenic disturbance uh, can negatively impact nesting habitat quality. Um, and we saw effects both on behavior and uh, demographic performance. So we saw avoidance, for example, of, of, um, of major roads. And we also saw that being closer to major roads did lead to lower nest survival. <laughs> uh, we, we found uh, no support for either the, the direct or the indirect um, hypotheses about how livestock grazing we thought livestock grazing would be, would be related to nest uh, nesting ecology, um, and really, it seemed that uh, you know sagebrush cover um, at, at multiple scales uh, was in, was important, and this again just sort of reinforces what we've what we've already known about about nesting sage grouse for a while. Um, and, and reinforces the importance of, of um, maintaining these big, uh, intact, sagebrush-dominated landscapes for, for sage grouse. So like I mentioned before, we, when we were analyzing um, the, this, this nest survival data uh, that I just presented to you, we made some kind of interesting discoveries that are um, are kind of changing the way we think about uh, range management for sage grouse and um, may ultimately uh, change some kind of controversial or what in the U.S. anyway has been controversial aspects of uh, federal grazing policy on sage grouse in sage grouse habitat. So this figure is from um, this uh, paper published by uh, Kevin Doherty and others uh, in 2000. 14, um, where they they found that um, grass height was you know this this major driver of, of sage grouse nest survival. The you know the taller the taller the grass around the nest, uh, the higher higher probability that nest would have of hatching. And this had been shown in other studies too. Um, there's there's a, a number of, of studies scattered throughout the range that have they're shown this same pattern. And and this is a figure from a from a um, progress report that we gave some of our funders in 2013, where we were saying basically, you know, we we found the exact same pattern. Um, we're this is this seems to be kind of a universal pattern in sage grass. The taller the you know grass grass height surrounding the nest just seems to be a major driver of, of nest survival. But then. Um, Last last January, um, we uh, we were at a uh, an oversight. We have an oversight committee for the that Roundup um, grazing study, and um, someone someone mentioned uh, 
that it was a bit strange that you know live live grass height seemed to be this major driver of nest survival, but a residual grass height we you know never came out as significant in our models. And they were wondering why that was, and they were asking, well, do you have a do you have an issue where you're where you tend to be measuring successful nests later on in the season when grass has had a chance to grow more, and and you're measuring it measuring vegetation at failed nests earlier on, and and there's sort of a bias built in, and 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 I said, no, no, that couldn't, you know, we've we've accounted for that. We've got nests, it, you know, they're staggered out all the way all the way across a couple of months. We couldn't possibly have that much of a systematic bias, and but it got got the wheels kind of turning in my head, and I went went back, uh, and for the rest of that week, I kind of worked on this, and I figured out, yeah, actually, we do have <coughs> a pretty systematic bias <coughs> worked into our worked into our data, data collection protocol. So <clears throat> what you're seeing here is just a, a ranking, all of our nests ranked out by <clears throat> the first day that they were found um, during just one nesting season, 2015. <clears throat> and um, so the first, the first uh, dot is going to be the day we found it, and the last dot is going to be the last day we the day we either found it hatched or, or failed, if it's a failed nest, and blue, so the blue lines are failed nests, the red lines are hatched nests. And then these dotted vertical lines indicate um, the blue one is the average day that we measured vegetation at a failed nest, and the red one is the average day that we measured vegetation at a successful nest. And there's a difference of, um, you know, uh, well, almost 20 days, uh, I think a little over two weeks there. So this pattern held up for every single year of our study at that point. <clears throat> so we had this systematic bias in the timing of when we were measuring vegetation. And um, turns out that that systematic timing bias uh, propagated into a systematic bias in grass height. And when we, when we looked at just um, that kind of slope of, of um, the, the height of grass that we measured at the plot uh, on the date of measurement, we saw that there was a, a pretty tight relationship there. And so basically our, our, our biased methods were um, propagating into, into a bias that drove this, um, this so-called uh, effect on, on nest survival. And right around that time, um, there was a uh, paper that came out of a group from Nevada that found the exact same thing. They found that when you measured vegetation following the fate, so either hatch or failed, you get this uh, positive effect of grass height on nest survival. But then when you, um, if you measure everything kind of on the, on the same footing where you're measuring everything at the predicted hatch date, regardless of whether it hatches or fails, you get no effect of grass height. So um, we wanted to know kind of how general that result was, um, and how many you know how many other data sets had been um, had found this signal just as a result of, of a biased uh, biased data collection method. So we looked at um, our own data set from from the Roundup grazing study uh, that I presented, and then we also looked at um, three, and we've actually added since then uh, we've added two more. Um, uh, sites to this. So we're up to, I think, uh, about 1,500 nests over um, six different study areas um, that we're, we're analyzing. And we're, we're working on trying to get this paper um, ready to publish right now. But uh, we basically wanted to know how, how general those results were. Um, and it turns out that in, at least in, in all um, so the, the, the top one is from the, the this row A is here, uh, is from the, the Gibson study that was already published. But in all four of our reanalyzed uh, data sets that we looked at, the exact same patterns held up. When you, when you measured vegetation uh, following fate, which was the, the kind of the bias method, you ended up find, finding a statistically significant, uh, strong relationship between grass height and nest survival. But then when you accounted for that, that phenological variation, that growth in grass through time, um, the the effect on survival goes away. 
Um, and I'll, I'll just kind of skip some of this because it's just driving home the same point. I think I'm running out of time here, but um, takeaway message, I guess, is if, if, if the height of grass isn't that important, and this is something that's been kind of drilled into our head for a long time now, is that this hiding cover is a big deal for, for nesting sage grouse. But if it's not as important as we thought, then um, a few there's a few implications of that. Uh, one, possibly the negative effects of grazing might not be quite as common as we thought. Um, but we also have all these federal grazing policies that uh, specify minimum grass heights. So that map on the right is showing you in the red, these are BLM, Bureau of Land Management um, uh, districts that have minimum grass heights for sage grouse uh, nesting habitat that are based on these uh, studies that by and large uh, we're using um, methods that we now know produce biased results. Um, and ultimately I think there's just a there's a lot more that, that out there to learn about uh, grazing management and sage grouse and I think um, it's not probably quite as, as simple as, as we thought as we used to think it was. Um, and I think this also argues for, um, you know, just main, maintaining kind of our, you know, given that we have limited resources for conservation, we really need to maintain uh, focus on, on those drivers that I showed you earlier that we know are, um, are, are drivers of habitat loss. Um, so, yeah, with, uh, with that, I think, like I said, I'm, I'm probably about out of time, but I um, want to mention uh, a lot of people helped out with this research. Um, yeah, my my advisor, Dave Noggle, uh, my PhD committee, um, a ton of field technicians over the years for that Roundup study, um, and then uh, funders, including um, NRCS Sage Grouse Initiative, uh, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, uh, Nature Conservancy, Pheasants Forever, uh, a couple of federal agencies, the BLM and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And um, yeah, with that, I'd, I'd be happy to take some questions if I have any time. Definitely. Thank you very much, Joe, for the great presentation. I know I learned a lot, um, and I really appreciate all the work that you're doing uh, south of the border there. Uh, we do have a question from a listener named Krista. Krista's wondering, were new fences built to facilitate the SGI rotational grazing? Yeah, that's that's a good question, and the answer is a, is definitely yes. Um, these uh, most of the time, uh, a, a ranch that enrolled in SGI grazing uh, ended up increasing the number of pastures, so that involved uh, doing some cross fencing. Great, thank you. I would just like to remind our listeners out there, if you have any questions, please feel free to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard. Um, there's another question here from a listener. Um, so why do does long periods of rainfall negatively impact nest survival? Well, um, my uh, my hypothesis for that, I guess, uh, my hunch is that uh, grouse can probably sit out uh, a day of rain. Um, they probably don't have any problem with that. Um, you know, they have the energy to reserves to do that, but um, once you get two or three or four days of rain, they're less able to stay on the nest. They have to get off at some point just to, to go feed. And when they're doing that during inclement weather, you know, I think that <clears throat> there's, a, there's a much higher chance that those eggs are going to get cold. Um, uh, it could, could also have something to do with, um, I've, I've, heard, I've heard people say that, you know, finding finding wet bird, like if they're bird hunters uh, uh, with dogs, dogs have a lot easier time finding wet birds than dry birds just because it, it, uh, it makes them makes them easier to smell. They you know, have a stronger smell. So I think it could be could be one or both of those. I'm not sure though exactly. Great, thank you. A listener named Rob would like to know if field assistants were hired from the local community. And if so, was this positive? Uh, for the most part, no. But we did have uh, we did have some um, field help. I would say 
uh, out of that list that's probably about <laughs> 25 or 30 people long we had um, a handful that grew up in ranching communities around there in somewhere in eastern Montana not all of them like local but um, but yeah for the most part we we required that people had uh, a degree in 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 wildlife so uh, we didn't get a lot of, of of local help okay thank you um, the next question, is the dramatic variation in weather experienced during your study normal for Mo historically normal for Montana? Um, they, they called, you know, that, that 2011, that year where we had the, the biggest storms and the, and the lowest nest survival, um, that was kind of referred to as a 100-year flood event. Um, so uh norm normal is kind of a um a, a relative term but i think i think those sorts of things are bound to happen um with some frequency um but i also from from what i understand um severe weather li events like that are actually getting more common um due to climate change um so this this region is 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 uh forecasted to get uh more frequent severe spring storms so that's something that's a little bit concerning thank you um the last question that we have right now um again for any listeners out there who have questions please feel free to type it in um so the last question what can conservation practitioners in saskatchewan learn from your research and apply to critical conservation efforts for sage grouse here well i think i think a lot of these issues are, are fairly relevant because I think that the, the major drivers of land use change in, in eastern Montana and Saskatchewan are probably pretty similar. Um, I think it's, you know, the big, the big top-down threat is cropland conversion. And I know that, um, you know, conservation easements are, are probably uh, it's probably the same situation there where conservation easements are really one of the only tools that you have to prevent um, habitat loss due to cropland conversion on private land. So um, I guess uh, the, the kind of lessons about um, uh, you know, the, the, the primacy of, of those, of those uh, top-down threats and driving, driving overall population um, distribution um, probably apply up there as well and um, yeah as far as as far as grazing goes I also think that you know that of all the uh, sage grouse research that's been done um, the the roundup study area is one of you know one it's not it's not exactly close to Saskatchewan but it's one of the closest that exists so um, the the type of vegetation that we have out there is is um is you know uh, more or less the same um same species it's a little bit drier than what you have up there but um, i imagine the findings of the of that grazing study are are fairly relevant to um rangelands up in your corner of the world mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we have another question here from a listener named Krista again. Uh, was there a difference in nesting success depending on what time of season grazing was initiated in a given field? For example, was nesting success higher when grazing was delayed until July? Um, no, and I and I I wonder if that <laughs> I wonder if that question might be related to that recent. Uh, we had a paper that came out of the USGS and, and Colorado State University uh, that, that was uh, blowing up my email box uh, earlier this week, and they were showing that uh, later later grazing was better um, in in Wyoming, and earlier grazing um, had had some negative impacts, and um, they were hypothesizing that that had you know was related to nesting. Um, and I, I think they're the mechanisms that they kind of speculate about are are I mean they're they're very speculative they they don't they don't really they can't really say a whole lot about about the mechanisms 
and um, we, you know, we didn't see any impacts of grazing whatsoever. We had a lot of pastures that were not grazed for the entire nesting season. You know, we had a lot of nests where there was no, it was either rested, there had been no grazing for the prior 15 months, and we had a lot of pastures that just weren't rest or that weren't grazed during during nesting, and, and it, it didn't make any difference whether there were cows in there or not. So, um yeah, I think uh, I'll just I'll just repeat that I think there's a <laughs> there's a lot more we need to learn about about impacts of cattle, but um, yeah, that's that's an interesting question. I I think um, there's there's a lot of other grazing research going on right now, and um, I hope somebody else can can shed a little bit of light on that because um, we can't really because we didn't see you know we didn't see any impact of grazing at all or, or livestock presence at all, so. Great, thank you. Um, I would just like to remind our listeners that um, this webinar has been recorded and you can check out the PCAP YouTube channel for a recording of this presentation. Um, and I guess with that, I would like to thank you very much, Joe, for the great presentation. And I would like to thank all of our listeners for tuning in. Um, when you exit this webinar, there will be a quick questionnaire, and I'll just like to ask everyone to take a minute to fill it out, and it'll really help us um, to keep the funding so we can do this, uh, this type of webinar again. So thank you very much, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye.